Hi everyone, this is a revision video for UA Fanthorpe's poem, Not My Best Side. This is one of seven poems which AQA have collected for the AQA Comedy Anthology. You might be doing this, uh, these poems in the first year of your course, you might be doing them in your second, but if you're doing comedy instead of tragedy, then these poems might be um, ones that you're doing. Uh, I have done a video for all of the other poems as well, so please look at the A-level poetry playlist for that. Um, the aims of this video are the same as they were for all the other poems as well, all the other videos I've done. Um, the main part of the presentation is actually to analyse the poem for AO2 and to make sure we have got all the key quotes and devices. I'm going to start though by looking at AO1 and some of the key literary concepts or terms that you can use to complement your analysis with this poem. Um, then I'll move on to AO3, which is the social and historical context. And then to finish, after I have analysed the poem with you, to finish, I will then turn attention to the comedic tradition generally, because of A-level, we are interpreting these texts through the lens of comedy. So we don't only need to know the texts really well, but we also need to know why they belong to the comedic tradition of literature. So that is what this presentation is all about. And with this anthology, the exam board have given you seven different snapshots, really, of the comedy genre. So there's a bit of satire in there. There's a bit of domestic, um, domestic kind of dysfunctionality. There's a bit of borediness. There's some taboo. So there's lots of different aspects of comedy across these seven poems. So for AO1, uh, for Not My Best Side, um, we've got four key terms here. And again, it's always the case that particularly with AQA, AQA have always said that it's AO5, which is, which is your interpretations, which are important. So you don't need to fill your essays with lots of complex devices and terminology. Uh, it actually, less works better, actually. So with this poem, I usually get my students to look at these four terms. Um, the poem is structured in three monologues, um, which is an extended speech or response from a particular person or character. So in this poem, which is about a painting, we'll talk about that in a second, the first stanza is the dragon's monologue, the second stanza is the maiden's monologue, and the third stanza, the knight is speaking in his monologue. So there is a distinct structure. So we have three different perspectives in this poem. The poem is also written in free verse, which means there is no formal rhythm or rhyme. It sounds like natural speech. And perhaps one of the most important terms and perhaps the more technical of the four is ekphrasis, which is impressive to use for AO1, which is a text which is inspired by a work of art. So this is an ekphrastic poem, which is the adjective. It means that it, this poem is from an existing work of art. And I'll show you that in a second. And finally, the way in which the characters talk are quite informal, uh, and therefore we can say there's quite a colloquial tone to this poem, which again forms much of the comedy um, in this actual poem itself. So like I said, the, this is the painting. Uh, this is the painting that Fanthorpe has used. It's by a man called Uccello, I think is how you pronounce it, or Ucello, it's up to you, I think. Um, but this is um, how this is the painting that the poem is inspired by. So this is the reason why we use that term ekphrasis with this poem. You can see here that this is a depiction of St. George on, and the dragon. And St. George there on horseback, the patron saint of England. We celebrate him on the 23rd of April in England. But on the left of the picture there, we have the maiden, uh, who strangely seems to have the dragon on a bit of a piece of string. Who knows why? Um, and George there has the spear, uh, who is, and he's um, jousting almost with the dragon. Notice that this painting has quite a triangular composition, and the artist Uccello, um, or Ucello, was very, um, he was well known for his kind of triangular compositions and triangular features in his artwork. So you can see by the way in which these characters are stood, there's a triangular kind of composition going on here. Notice as well that the drag, the sorry, the uh, ma the um, knight looks very very young. He doesn't particularly look here like you know a knight in shining armor. He looks a bit like a toddler um, without any facial hair. Um, and the dragon as well has two feet instead of four. 
So whether it was an error or deliberate, the artist has not actually drawn the dragon correctly because dragons actually have four feet, not two. So perhaps the, um, the artist was a little bit confused with dinosaurs here, perhaps. Um, and also the maiden there stood not looking particularly terrified. She just looks like she's having a bit of a conversation with the dragon, doesn't she? Um, talking about the weather, maybe. So this is the painting that Fanthorpe is using. And what she does by using these three monologues from each of these characters is she comically undermines the painting. We expect painting to be part of high culture. Um, you know, we think of art galleries, we think of classical works, we think of kind of educated elites, perhaps. Um, so what Fanthorpe is doing is she's almost debunking or undermining this kind of stereotype of art being kind of higher class, um, having a higher class audience. Um, what's also important with this poem is we look at this painting and we expect to have a narrative for this painting. We expect the maiden to be the one who's the victim. We expect the dragon to be the beast uh, who wants to kill the maiden. And we expect the knight to be chivalrous and gallant and saving the maiden and they will have a happy ever after. So what we do naturally to do with stereotype and I suppose cultural constructions of gender is we assign our own, I suppose, stereotypical interpretation to this painting. But what Fanthorpe is doing is she's subverting gender stereotypes in this painting. So in other words, just because the maiden is there doesn't mean the maiden is a victim. Just because the beast is there doesn't mean he wants to eat the maiden. And just because the knight is there doesn't mean he's heroic or gallant or chivalrous. So what she's doing, what Fanthorpe is doing, is she's comically undermining these characters. And we have a difference, a disparity here, between what we expect the narrative to be of this painting and what we expect the characters to be like and what they're actually like. So there's this disparity, this conflict between, I suppose, illusion of this painting and the reality of this painting. So having that image in your head is always quite useful when we analyse this poem. OK, so to almost um, reinforce that point, really, uh, for AO3, the social and historical context for this, and like I've said in other videos, AQA don't want this to turn into a history essay. They don't. You don't need to write about St George. You don't, you don't need to write a paragraph about St George and the myth of St George, because it's it's irrelevant really. Um, the the social and historical context is there to support your interpretation, so it's it has to be relevant to what you are saying and not bolted on. Um, so Fanthorpe uses the painting of St George and the Dragon to subvert gender stereotypes and mock high art. We've just been speaking about that. When we see the painting as a viewer, we assume that the knight is the hero. We assume that the dragon is the evil threat, the antagonist almost. And we assume that the maiden is the victim, the trembling victim. But what Fanthorpe is doing is she's inverting that almost and she's undercutting that. And she's actually making the characters completely different. So we have this disparity between the illusion of the painting and what the characters are actually like. So the traditional narrative of the painting conforms to typical gender stereotypes um, relating to gender. So men being powerful, women being weak and timid and needing men to save them. So what Fanthorpe is doing is he's actually making a maiden character uh, more empowered than that. Um, this is not kind of the gothic trembling victim that we expect. Um, again, the knight isn't the chivalrous hero. He's actually a bit of a fool, a bit of an arrogant idiot, actually. So again, Fanthorpe is comically undercutting those characterizations that we expect. So you could say that this is a satirical presentation of gender types and depictions of men and women in the 70s, which is when this painting was written in the 1970s. We have an ambitious male. We have a self-obsessed um, and quite vain maiden as well. But the dragon also is quite friendly and quite equal and quite informal and also quite vain as well. Um, and it appears that the dragon doesn't actually want to eat the maiden, uh, which is conflicted with what we expect. So that's all AO3. So going into the poem then, in terms of an analysis for AO2, uh, what can we talk about? So the poem starts with the dragon's monologue. This is half of it. And the dragon starts by saying, not my best side, I'm afraid. The artist didn't give me a chance to pose properly. And as you can see, poor chap, he had this obsession with triangles. So he left off two of my feet. I didn't comment at the time what, after all, our two feet were monster. 
but afterwards I was sorry for the bad publicity. So firstly, you can tell from, from the actual tone, we have quite an informal register here. We, we are not confronted with a vicious, monstrous beast that we were expecting. And that parenthesis there, the, the, the words in brackets that I haven't highlighted actually, but the brackets again add to that informality and that kind of rhetorical question. Um, the, the, dragons, the, the uh, dragon starts by using the title of the poem, Not My Best Side, I'm afraid. So if you think about taking a selfie, sometimes people have a preferred side of their face that they like in a selfie because they think it makes them look better. So there is a degree in vanity in that. Um, and the same thing with the dragon. The dragon believes that the artist didn't um, depict him properly. Maybe the dragon thought he's more attractive than the artist made out. So the dragon is quite, um, I suppose, disappointed that the artist didn't give him a chance to pose properly. So criticising the artist and drawing attention to the construction of the painting, that the dragon is aware that he has been depicted in this painting, almost as if he's sitting there posing for it. And obviously that wouldn't have happened, but um, there is a sense that there is an absurdity here because the, a beast is talking in the first place. So we have a dragon who is talking human language, which is obviously absurd and adds to this kind of almost surreal tone of this poem. The artist is also called a poor chap, so there's quite a friendly informal register there, like I said, but there's also that reference to the obsession with triangles and left off two of the feet. So the dragon is aware that he hasn't been depicted properly um, and therefore, again, he is critiquing or criticising the artist for not depicting him well. And that's the reason why at the end of the poem, at the end of this part of the stanza, sorry, in this uh, green section, I was sorry for the bad publicity. The dragon is almost blaming the artist for making him look bad when actually he's a dragon. Um, so almost what did you expect? So the, uh, the dragon seems to have no um, thought about the fact he's a dragon. It, he's almost humanised in a way. Um, and the artist is the one that gets the blame for the absurdity of the composition and, and the painting and the depiction of him. Dragon's monologue finishes with why I said to myself, should my conqueror be so ostentatiously beardless and ride a horse with a deformed neck and square hoofs? Why should my victim be so unattractive as to be inedible? And why should she have me literally on a string? I don't mind dying ritually since they always rise again, but I should have liked a little more blood to show they were taking me seriously. So the informal tone continues, and here in the green section there, ostentatiously beardless, the dragon is mocking the knight for being kind of almost boyish, it doesn't seem very masculine. He also sarcastically mocks the horse, this is not kind of a noble steed, but kind of a, a horse that doesn't look right, with a strange neck and almost square hooves. In the blue section there, the dragon then also starts to mock the maiden and, and he critiques the maiden as being ugly. Um, we think, for example, that the dragon wants to eat the maiden because she looks good to eat. But actually, that's not the case. The dragon doesn't want to eat her at all. And then she then the dragon kind of mocks the fact that the composition of the painting shows that the dragon is almost on a leash, on a string almost. And, and again, the, the fact that it's asking a rhetorical question means we don't really quite know why that's there. It's kind of absurd again. And the dragon finishes this, um, his monologue by saying that he lives on in the painting almost. He's, he's therefore quite heroic. He always rises again. But he then says, because of his vanity, and he would have liked to have died a little bit more like a martyr, that he would have liked a little, more, more, bit, little bit more blood in the composition because it, there wasn't a lot. It was just kind of dripping from his mouth. And he would have liked a little bit more red stuff because it would have made him look a bit more heroic or a bit more brave or a bit more like a martyr. So the dragon is not terrifying. He's not beastly. He's not evil or monstrous. He's actually quite informal, to some extent quite friendly, but also quite vain. And that is one way in which the character is uh, subverted. One of the characters is subverted in this poem. We then move into the second monologue, and now it's the maiden's turn to speak. So we get a new perspective of that same painting, that same event. And she says it's hard for a girl to be sure if she wants to be rescued. I mean, I quite took to the dragon. It's nice to be liked, if you know what I mean. He was so nicely physical with his claws and lovely green skin and that sexy tail. And the way he looked at me, he made me feel he was all ready to eat me. And any girl enjoys that. So we start with that yellow section at the top. The maiden isn't actually that bothered about being rescued. We expect her to be kind of desperate to survive. We expect her to be desperate to be saved. But she isn't. 
the reason for that is she quite likes the dragon. She she finds the dragon quite quite sexy. She finds the dragon quite um, attractive. And again, that's absurd because we have a maiden who's fallen in love with a myth mythical beast, and that mythical beast is supposed to be quite evil. Many students say this reminds them of Shrek and the and the dragon and the donkey in Shrek. I think the donkey marries the dragon, doesn't he? In that, it's been a long time since I've watched Shrek, but I think uh, that's along the lines of what happens. Um, so there's an absurdity here going on that the maiden is actually sexually attracted to a mythical beast. Um, again, she uses quite informal colloquialisms like the words like lovely green skin, physical, sexy tail, which again, um, I suppose, conflict with the archaic um, depiction of this myth on, on canvas. There's also a lot of innuendo. So we have in the uh, the green sections there, there's some sexual innuendo coming through. You can almost imagine her saying this with a kind of a wink, wink approach. You know what I mean, she says, um, eat me and any girl enjoys that. So rather than her, you know, feeling like she's close to death and being eaten in a savage way, in a fatal way, she's actually using the, the dragon's desire to eat her in a kind of a flirtatious or, or sexual way, in a bawdy way. So she's actually not a victim at all, but a, a quite a, um, a sexually aware um, maiden character. She's not very virginal, as we might expect, perhaps. And then she finished her monologue by saying, so when this boy turned up wearing machinery on a really dangerous horse, to be honest, I didn't much fancy him. I mean, what was he like underneath the hardware? He might have acne, blackheads, or even bad breath for all I could tell. But the dragon, well, you could see all his equipment. At a glance, still, what could I do? The dragon got himself beaten by the boy, and a girl's got to think of her future. So we have a fronted conjunction there, so, again, very informal. And like the dragon, she also mocks him for being a boy, not a man. So mocking the knight's kind of sense of gallantry and heroism here and bravery. She, she's also mocking the horse. She kind of is sarcast, sarcastic. She believes that the horse isn't looking very dangerous. The horse actually looks quite timid, perhaps. So this isn't a heroic depiction of knight on, on horseback at all. Um, we have kind of the narrative of the painting being subverted. I didn't much fancy him. So again, she doesn't actually fancy the knight very much. She fancies the dragon more. So it goes against the narrative of the painting and also stereotypical constructions of gender, what we expect them to do. Um, and we also have kind of the triviality of and the shallowness of the of the maiden. She rather than worrying about the fact that she's close to death and needs to be saved quite quickly, she's worrying about the appearance of the knight uh, and the threat, I suppose, to to her that he might have acne, black heads or bad breath, which is obviously ridiculous. And the analogy that I use with students is it's like falling into a swimming pool and um, only wanting to get rescued if you're drowning by a lifeguard with a six pack. Um, obviously, in that moment, your life, you would believe, would come first. You don't care who rescues you as long as you live um, another day. So the maiden here is actually presented as quite shallow and quite trivial in, in her kind of uh, what she regards to be important. There's a euphemism there. You could see all his equipment at a glance. So, again, there's a there's sexual undertones coming through here. But towards the end of this, she actually turns out to be quite insipid, quite self-obsessed. Um, a girl's got to think of her future, which means that she's probably more wanting to be with the knight just because it, it helps her future prospects rather than the dragon. So she's only thinking of herself, really, and decides to be with the knight, perhaps just because she feels it will be easier for her in terms of her prospects. So that's the maiden. And then finally, the last monologue, the last stanza is the knight speaking. Um, and the knight is all about himself. I have diplomat and dragon management and virgin reclamation. My horse is the latest model with automatic transmission and built in obsolescence. My spear is custom built and my prototype armour still on the secret list. You can't do better than me at the moment. I'm a qualified and equipped to the eyebrow. So why be difficult? This reminds me, for those of you that watch The Apprentice, usually the first episode is all about the candidates saying how they're the best things since sliced bread and very arrogant, very egotistical. And, and that's how the knight is presented here. He's boasting, he's egotistical, he's quite arrogant. He's also speaking in a very anachronistic way because obviously the knight, uh, in, in, in terms of St George, would not have spoken in this way. And very similar to the poem Mrs Sisyphus, um, there's a, there's a sense of revision here going on. There's a sense that the knight is speaking in a way that we understand. 
um, you know, boasting about his qualifications, boasting about his car, which is actually referring to the horse. It helps us understand what he's boasting about. And obviously, clearly, um, he is somebody that thinks, you know, he's the best man ever um, and he's boasting. So, and he says in that declarative sentence, you can't do better than me at the moment. So again, that just sums up his pompousness and his arrogance. He says, I'm fully equipped to the eyebrow. So why be difficult? So he doesn't quite understand why the maiden is, is being difficult and not just running to him. Uh, and they, they ride off into the, into the sunset. Um, she doesn't quite understand why she's not wowed by him. Okay. So again, it's all about his image, all about his... Um, all about his kind of arrogance, really. Towards the end of the poem, the last part of his monologue, he says, don't you want to be killed and or rescued in the most contemporary way? Don't you want to carry out the roles that sociology and myth have designed for you? Don't you realise that by being choosy, you are endangering job prospects in the spear and horse building industries? What in any case does it matter what you want? You're in my way. So he finishes there being quite dismissive. He's not the chivalrous saviour on horseback that we expect. So the narrative of the painting and also the characters are comically undercut. Um, in the green there at the top, uh, repetition of rhetorical questions suggests that we're told his thinking process. He doesn't quite understand why the, the, the maiden isn't wowed by him in the, in the way that he thinks she should, she should be. Um, and... He's basically concerned in a kind of comic way because obviously what he's saying there is that, so that society and myth have designed for you a particular role that you're supposed to stick to. You're supposed to be the maid and wanting to be rescued. You're supposed to make me look good is what he's saying. And because she isn't, he's worried. And that's why he kind of alludes this idea of job prospects uh, in spear and horse building industries. The idea being that you know, traditional symbols of gallantry and heroics will will go out of business. Will get out. Will go out of business because of the fact that she isn't being rescued. So, what do we need spears and horses for if maidens don't want to be rescued? So he's kind of comically updating uh, language there. Fanthorpe is to um, to make it more, I suppose, relatable to us in terms of how he's speaking. So, in summary, what he's saying is, if maidens don't want to be rescued, what's the point in having horses and spears? We need those to, to save them. So he's kind of coming across very arrogant, but also very dismissive there in the end. So that's the poem. Um, we now need to link it to AO4, the aspect of comedy. So we have quite a lot, as you can see here. We have innuendo, boredomness, sex and lust from the maiden. We have suffering is prevented. So even though this is a depiction of perhaps a fatal situation from the maiden's perspective and also the dragon's perspective, there is no mention of death, really. Um, suffering is prevented. Dysfunctional relationships between all three of them, but also the relationship between the characters and the painting as well is interesting to talk about, too, for AO5. There's a high level of, of absurdity, clearly because we have a dragon who is talking, but also the, the how in which, how they're, they're speaking as well is quite absurd and, and how they are romantically interested in, in the characters that we don't expect. Rivalry between all of them, the knight's posturing, pretentiousness and arrogance, perhaps. The triviality of the maiden in worrying about the black heads and acne of the knight rather than being saved. The break from the formality of the painting. This is quite a formal, obviously, myth, a well-known myth. And yet Fanthorpe is comically breaking that formality. Subverting stereotypes. Ridiculing human weakness, particularly the maiden and the knight. To some extent the dragon as well but also drawing attention to the text's artifice, the construction of the text, and also the painting by the dragon mocking it, for example. So there is an awareness that what we're talking about here is an artifice, it's, it's all um, shallow, it's all a construction. So there's also that as well. So any of those would be AO4. Finally, um, why has this poem been included on a comedy specification? So you could say the, the uh, poem is a parody of traditional gender stereotypes and the assumed story of the painting. We expect one thing, but quickly realise from the way in which the characters are talking that we are going to get something that we didn't expect. There's a sharp wit and understated informal language, it's quite colloquial, which undercuts the cultural narrative of the painting. There's the irony between the way in which the knight sees himself as, as kind of God's gift 
but also the way in which the maiden and the knight, sorry, the maiden and the dragon see him, and also us maybe. We see him as a bit of a fool, as does the maiden and the dragon, but the knight thinks he's the best ever. So there's an irony there in, in how he's perceived. So the knight is, rather than being heroic, chivalrous and brave, he's actually arrogant, egotistical and vain. Rather than the maiden being scared, weak and virginal, she's actually sexually aware, insipid and vain as well. And rather than the dragon being monstrous, evil and sinister, he's actually friendly, witty, but also quite vain too. So all of them are quite shallow to some extent. They're all aware of their own image. Um, the language is also quite anachronistic because it, it you know, it places a more modern language, more a more modern register in an older context with an informal tone. Uh, we can talk about the pompousness of the foolishness of the knight, perhaps the sexual innuendo of the maiden and also the vanity of the dragon, plus the absurdity of the dragon actually talking. And finally, the fact that the maiden is quite trivial. Uh, this is a, a trivialisation of a potential life and death situation for both the maiden and the dragon. They're both close to being killed. So the maiden is seconds away from her demise, and yet the only thing she seems to care about is her attraction to the dragon, complimenting the dragon's sexy tail, for example, but also the appearance of her saviour, the knight. In effect, she believes that it would be better if her knight looked the part rather than having acne or black or, or black heads or bad breath. So she is trivialising a life and death situation. That's not often in a moment of crisis or emergency what we're most worried about. OK, so that trivialisation there, triviality is also something you can talk about from the maiden's perspective. So that is not my best side. In summary, then, it's it's a painting and Fanthorpe is comically undercutting or comically subverting the narrative of that painting and gender stereotypes, and that is where we get the comedy. Thank you.